Peter Boghossian is a philosophy instructor, critical thinker, and author of A Manual for Creating Atheists. He's also an anti-regressive warrior and can back it up with some jujitsu. <laughs> Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really looking forward to our chat. I am looking forward to it as well. You know, every week I feel like I'm connecting with people that I know in the digital space, right. mostly through 140 characters, and I, right. I put you in that group. You just did three hours with Rogan. I did. We had an interesting conversation. How are you feeling? You mentally? came up. You came up too. Good. I feel great. I yeah? feel great. Did, did you say good things about me? We said nothing. Well, you know, that's the thing. We don't. I think part of it is. When people are together and they're sincere, I think they'll they'll either agree or disagree, or there'll be a convergence around those ideas. And I started off when we were talking, thinking that I feel like I know you. Like I feel that the stuff that you think about and the values that you have are in congruence with my own values. And I think part of that comes from from a, a type of honesty with oneself. Yeah, well, we're obviously going to talk a lot about those values, and I, I think it really is cool that this, this group of people have yeah. come together. You were sort of in this a little bit before me and connected with Sam and some of those other guys, but now Rogan right. and Christina Hoff Summers, all these people who don't necessarily agree on right. everything, don't come from the same walks of life or the same socioeconomic stuff or whatever, that we've all sort of come together because we have these base principles Absolutely. that we want to put out there. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and I think that it's... So, so here's one way to think about it. We often think about the right and the left on some kind of a line. So there's the far right, which is obviously on the far right of the line, the far left, and the middle. There's this, in philosophy, there's a, a French philosopher who has this idea of a horseshoe theory. You take the ends of the line and you bend them together. The far left and the far right are closer to each other than they are to the center. Yeah. And so I think that that's a helpful heuristic or helpful way to look at some of these issues. And for me, it was, you know, rather than give a genealogical account about how this came to be, for, for me, what's always interesting is when I look at the mean-spiritedness, the anger, the uh, tactics of the regressives, they're just so fundamentally contrary to what my values are and for the sort of person that I want to become. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I do see that, that horseshoe, that far left and that far right. And in the left, the regressives seem extraordinarily angry and eager to smear those people with racist, sexist, homophobe, et cetera, if you don't buy into certain, even if you ask questions as opposed to buying into something. They've made any kind of discourse almost impossible. Yeah, well, we've talked a little bit about that. And I, as Sam said something, Sam Harris said something about how it's almost like scorched earth. I think yeah. I'm loosely quoting what he said, yeah. because the tactics have been so bad. But before we get into all that, let, let's talk about you a little bit so people can understand where you come from okay. and all this and, and the book that you've Written, which I just read this week, a oh. manual for creating atheists. It was it was wonderful. It was it was what I try to do here, actually, yeah. uh, which I guess goes to what you said at, at the top because it was understandable. You were trying to give people the tools to go about talking about, you know, reasoning and and morality without taking the leap of faith. Yeah, and and asking people starts off and so thank you for the the book. You enjoyed the book. I, I fully did. All right. I fully did. And if you didn't, you'd tell me. I absolutely would. Okay, so that's a type of sincerity, and I'd appreciate that. So yeah. so the the book talks about, in the my forthcoming app, Atheos, which talks about how to have more civil, productive conversations with people to help them break through dogmatism, to help them break through these deep-seated beliefs that they hold, and that they think that they're better people because they hold these beliefs. So how to really have productive conversations and engage people. Yeah, so I think the best way to jump off on this is let's just define some terms. And I've done this in one incarnation or another a few times on the show when we've talked right. about religion and atheism and agnosticism and all that. But why don't you just give me some basic definitions, which is sort of how you start the book. So just what is an atheist? So the way I define atheist, and I think it's right, th these are placeholder terms. I'm willing to revise those. I don't have... An atheist is a person who doesn't have sufficient evidence to warrant belief in God, but if they were given that evidence, then they would believe. So inherent in the term atheist, or the way that I use it, is a sort of open-mindedness. Right, which is funny to me, and that's the way you describe it in the book, because there seems to be a certain subset of people that think that atheists are actually the most close-minded people. But that's not the way you're defining it, and maybe that's just uh, sort of the personalities that have been publicly attached to atheism or something. Well, to a certain extent, we... 
we can understand why someone would think that because the word theist is contained with the word atheist. And just as theists tend to have these dogmas where they latch on to religious propositions, faith, faith, propositions of faith, so too one would think that atheist d does. But again, I think that the, the faithful have constructed these narratives to, to make it as if there's some kind of a parallelism, a symmetry of belief. Look, we believe these things, you guys believe these things. We, we, we have beliefs that are predicated on no evidence, just like you do. Right. And, and I, I, don't, I, I think that's a type of insincerity. I, I don't think that people who are honest with themselves and have a minimal level, uh, uh, you know, basically enough in, intelligence to tie a shoe, a shoeless, I, I don't think that it's possible to come to that conclusion. Yeah. So, so before we go too deep on that, yeah, what, yeah. what are the other what are the other terms we should just define right at the beginning? So, agnosticism, for example, um, I which I, you don't you're not big on. No, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like the term. I I think it's a it's a useless term, and we need to do away with it. You you, you don't believe in Santa Claus. No. Okay. So you are a Santa Claus uh, atheist. You're not a Santa Claus agnostic. Right. So the word agnostic is gives wiggle room where s no wiggle room should exist. The default to any belief shouldn't be maybe. The, the default should probably be no unless I have sufficient evidence to believe. Right. But again, that's part of the hijacking of the, the narrative. Right. So that's interesting. So a lot of people I've heard lately, they describe themselves as agnostic atheists. Yeah. That seems to be like the new yeah, it's weird. out there. Have you heard about that one? Where it's, it's giving yeah. them, I guess, a little more wiggle room, but you're saying that that in a way that's sort of cheating the the idea here, right? Yeah, and I mean, maybe people self-describe that way because they feel they want to reap some social benefits from it. Maybe they feel that they don't want to offend people or insult people or make people feel bad, so that they use these wiggle terms. Yeah. So in the book, well, first off, is there anything else we should define? Oh. Just real quick, uh, right? I off don't. That. No, I don't think so. But if uh, if we've defined something and it's, you're right, it's important to define words, and those can be placeholders for later on, because if someone says, I'm an agnostic atheist, I'll say, well, what do you mean by that? And I can challenge or what have you, but if not, it's like two ships passing between each other. Like, we don't know what the conversation is about. And but, there was a lot of that in the book where you're talking about, you know, people with faith and people without faith, or <laughs> non-believer versus believer, whatever, however you want to define it. Yeah. They're, they're talking about two different things, and that sometimes makes the conversation really kind of crazy. It does, and that's the problem with faith, is that it has a broad semantic range, and people try to use the term to do some work that it doesn't do. Yeah. Like, they try to use the term to protect, like, well, I believe that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse, or I believe Jesus walked in water, or, I, you know, fasting, or the Dalai Lama incarnates through bodies, whatever. It, but I, you just, you have faith your wife loves you, or you have faith in a plane. So they use that term as an umbrella term to almost cover their beliefs from any, make it impervious to reason. Yeah. And I just don't think that's, that's a very sincere way to approach any inquiry. Right, so I think a lot of people, just from this first five or six minutes, are gonna say, wow, this guy, this guy's a pretty open-minded atheist. Like, that, that's gonna be part of it. And I think one of the things you said right at the beginning of the book is you don't really define yourself as an atheist. And I thought, I your, re I thought your reasoning was actually really clever. Can you go into that a little what, bit? It, what, what you tell me what you got of it, and then I'll, I'll. Well, basically, you were saying I don't define myself as someone that doesn't believe in leprechauns. Yeah, or, that's right. Right. So, so, but but yet there seems to be with atheists, there seems to be so much onus on them to constantly have to talk about it or, or whatever it is. I, I've only been in this. Con I never even publicly said that I was an atheist. Yeah, I heard until you say that. Yeah. Literally, it was about two months ago, I think, yeah. when Milo Yiannopoulos was on the show. I always considered myself sort of a friend of the atheist community. I always liked atheists. I like free thinkers. I like critical thinkers. It never, it wasn't something that really hit me one way or another. I didn't feel like I needed to say, all right, I have to yeah. make this announcement or this announcement. But somehow in that conversation with him, I had finally sort of got to my breaking point or something. Well, that was good then. It was a good conversation. So yeah, it was all good. Kind it was of all public good. honesty then. Yeah. A public honesty. And so yeah. I think that the word atheist still has some negative connotations and a lot of negativity is attached to it. But I don't, I think that atheism is a conclusion and it's ultimately it's much less important that, than epistemological hygiene, if you will, like thinking about you, how you come to knowledge and making sure that, that, that those ways to come to knowledge are reliable. Because that's the other thing that was a big realization for me a long time ago is that, that faith, faith claims are knowledge claims. 
So when someone makes a faith claim, they're making a claim about the world. Like, I have faith because of X. So people use faith as a process to get to a claim about the world. I mean, the whole thing is just so bizarre and yeah. <clears throat> twisted. But unfortunately, we're, we live in... It's surrounded, surrounding us, but I don't, I don't have, it's weird to me, like, I'll go to, I'll speak at an atheist conference, and people be singing about being atheists, and so it's just, I can't, it's just unfathomable. To right, me. well, that's why your description of it felt decent to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It does, it certainly, as I said, I didn't talk about it until three months ago, it's never, I don't think it will ever be something that defines me. What defines me are my thoughts and my, the, the breadth of all the things that I am, but that's just, to define yourself by something you don't believe in actually doesn't make that much sense, right? Yeah, and I'm try, trying to think about defining yourself in terms of your thought. I don't even know if I'd, I'd do that. I mean, I think it's important to ask yourself, what kind of person do you want to be? Yeah. Like, you know, I want to be a kind person. I want to be a compassionate person. I am very confident that those values are derivable through reason and that we can articulate ways to get through those very clearly. But I'm not, I'm not sure if, here, maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe I'm wrong to think about it. Maybe I want to be the type of person who's willing to revise my beliefs. Maybe I want to be the type of person who's inquisitive and trustful of reason and who treats people well. You know, maybe that's the kind of person I want to become. So maybe those things are, identif I self-identify with those. But I don't, it's just an odd thing to me to latch that on to an identity. Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with that. So a lot of what you're doing in the book is really, and I think you actually use this word, is to deprogram people yeah. from faith. And I thought using that word was particularly interesting because you're viewing it as sort of, you know, we all enter this, right. this life sort of as a clean slate, and then right. we're programmed with this stuff, and you're trying to give everyone the tools to, to deprogram. Yeah, that's exactly right. We, we've been indoctrinated by ideas, culture. We have a, everybody has a kind of cultural myopia. That's reinforced by religion and beliefs. So how do we help people to become more reflective about their beliefs? How do we help people to become less dogmatic about, what they, about their thoughts? And, and you know, may, maybe that's why, like, for me, even the sexuality isn't part of an identity, but maybe that's because it's a dominant heteronormative <laughs> being, you know. So, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that people think that having certain beliefs makes them a better person. Dan Dennett talks about this in terms of belief and belief. And part of the problem is once you start thinking that your holding beliefs makes you a better person, you're much less likely to revise those because it moves from the realm of epistemology, that is knowledge, to the realm of morals. And you don't want to be that guy. Like, you don't want to be... Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. The difference yeah. between knowledge and morals, which people seem to conflate constantly, right? Yeah, and it's interesting in terms of the, the regressive left and the, I, the idea of race, when people talk about race, that is just so charged and so politicized that they have made it almost impossible for a sincere inquirer to ask a question without being smeared or labeled in some way. Yeah. And we've lost the ability, we've lost the ability in an academic context to ask sincere questions so that we could, the, the only way to solve any problem, the, f the first step is to be honest about it. If you're not honest about it, you're not gonna solve it. And yeah. you've written about this, and Douglas Murray was on Sam's podcast, other people have spoken about this, I've tweeted about this, and I wrote about this. If you do not allow questions, then extremists are eager to come in with answers. Yeah. And so that's one of the consequences that we see. And we see this in a religious landscape, very, especially with Islam now. I mean, we see this, we see this terrible problem.